Uh, please, <clears throat> sorry, let's please give a round of applause for our next speaker, uh, Theodore Hubbard. So thank you to Peter for inviting me, um, and I'm, I'm going to try to follow Robert and, and Alex's uh, talk here. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, my work with uh, near infrared spectroscopy over NEARS. Um, you heard actually a little bit about it because it's being integrated into some of these other analysis packages. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more on the math and the results that we do for, multi, for integrating NEARS with multimodal. Um, at the end of the talk, I will talk about some of our uh, software packages that we've been developing along those lines, particularly with dealing with um, some of the unique aspects of statistical analysis in NEARS uh, data. So first off, kind of hopefully, you know, since you've heard the term NEARS a few times already in this, this uh, three-day course, uh, you kind of have some sense of what NEARS is. But if not, here's your chance to catch back up. So NEARS is basically pulse oximetry. Pulse oximeter, right? You shine a red light through your finger, and if you had a detector on the other side, you would be able to look at the change in the signal as a function of time. If you count the blips per unit time, you could get the heart rate. If you looked at how red versus blue light was absorbed, you can determine oxygen saturation because oxy and deoxyhemoglobin absorb light differently, right? So instead of putting this on your finger, what we do in NEARS is we put it on your head. So we have some variation of an instrument that has light sources and light detectors. Um, in the older instruments, these were connected via fiber optics uh, to some sort of head cap that you'll see in a second. Now the modern day NEARS, a lot of them have actually integrated those optodes directly onto the head in um, uh, optodes uh, that look kind of like EEG caps now. Uh, they're a lot lighter and more portable in that way. But what we're doing with, with these systems is we're sending light in at a particular position. That light enters the tissue, it diffuses through the tissue because the scattering length, uh, the optical scattering length of biological tissue is about 100 microns. So that light doesn't go straight, doesn't go ballistic, it bounces around through the tissue. And then we have detectors that are collecting the light as it exits under these discrete positions. And so what we measure then is the optical, uh, is basically optical spectroscopy in kind of this diffuse volume between these different source and detector pairs. Now, the reason this works is because biological tissue has fairly low um, intrinsic absorption in what we call the near infrared window. It's this range between about 650 and about 900, uh, 950 nanometers in which light can actually travel centimeters through tissue. Uh, but as I mentioned, it doesn't go straight. So physically, it might be about a centimeter across my finger, but when I shine this laser pointer through, that light is taking about six centimeters of back and forth wandering, this very indirect path as it travels through my tissue. So you see here an example, you put the, you know, your hand over a light source and your whole hand glows red, right? Because the light is diffusing through the tissue, it's spreading out. But also red is the only uh, one of the visible colors here that's in the spectrum that we're actually seeing. So all the other colors, the blues, the greens, they get absorbed by your tissue and only red light is going through. So what this, uh, what this does is it allows us to do spectroscopy in tissue, uh, but it limits us to what we're able to measure because it has to be absorption, it has to be contrast within this uh, couple hundred nanometer range. So the big one for us is hemoglobin. Um, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin have very unique um, absorption profiles so we can determine how much oxygen uh, is in your blood and how much blood is there. Uh, we also have methods, uh, if we sum the two oxy and deoxy, we can get an estimate of volume. We have measures to measure blood flow, um, which are more based on things like laser speckle type imaging in diffuse tissue. There's other groups that try to look at some other chromophores like cytochrome C oxidase, lipids, waters, even optical scattering itself can be a biomarker of things like uh, tumors and stuff like that as, as the cell shape changes, it changes the optical scattering. Um, and then we can get derived measures, things like oxygen metabolism that you, you heard uh, in the context of, of uh, uh, Molly's MRI talks yesterday of CMRO2 derived from oxygen saturation and then a model of how flow and volume relate to each other. Um, there are uh, exogenous contrast agents. There's only one uh, endocyanide green that is FDA approved for human subjects that we can't actually inject fluorescent dyes uh, 
that absorb in this or for us and absorb in this uh, this um, this wavelength range that we can actually image into the human body. So these are the things that we can measure with mirrors. Today I'm going to talk almost entirely about uh, hemoglobin there, uh, which probably represents 99% of mirrors experiments. Um, so as I mentioned, as you shine light through the tissue, it doesn't go straight. So you might remember from maybe analytic chemistry, uh, you know, decades ago, the Beer-Lambert law. You took probably a, uh, a little cuvette or something, you put uh, food coloring in it, and you titrated this to get a calibration curve, and then your professor gave you an unknown concentration, and you did the same thing, and you measured how much light was absorbed, and you compared it to the calibration curve to find the concentration. Well, that's what we're doing, uh, only in the, the diffuse regime, one of the equations in that calibration was the path length. How long was that cuvette? And as I said, in your finger, it might be a centimeter. If you took a, a ruler and measured, but it's much, much longer than that because of this diffuse, uh, this diffuse property. And the problem with imaging something in the brain, and in particular, as Mark mentioned, putting absolute units on, on, on anything to actually you know, publish this kind of stuff, is we don't know what those path lengths are if we're talking about something as complicated as the brain, right? Because you've, everyone has slightly different structures, you've got different layers, they've got different baseline absorption properties, and so light travels a little bit differently. Um, and so that's going to come back up uh, when we start talking about multimodal, because well, optical alone maybe is not sufficient to provide some of that information, but maybe we can start to combine it uh, with other things that can give us some insights there. So if we, uh, the question we always get when we, we talk about near infrared spectroscopy, I'm shining light through your head, and someone in the audience kind of goes, what? How does that work? Um, light can travel about 5 to 8 millimeters into the actual brain itself. So in our typical experiments, we'll have a source and a detector pair. The distance between these is about three to three and a half centimeter. That's kind of an optimal distance that gives us uh, enough penetration to, as I said, get about five millimeters into the brain. As we increase that distance, we would, on average, get deeper, right? If I had a source detector on opposite sides of my head, that light would go all the way through my head. The problem is at what would be considered safe exposure limits to, you know, the rate to, to light powers and stuff, you would get about one photon every minute or so to cross that distance. So you'd be sitting there for several years to count enough photon statistics to actually do your study. So it's kind of this trade-off between signal to noise that we get when we make this spacing really close and depth of penetration as we spread it apart. So that three, three and a half centimeters used uh, in most near studies, and it gives us uh, uh, sensitivity to the outer cortex of, of the brain. Um, obviously, things we're not going to go after things like brain stem and stuff with, with, with mirrors. And that's through the almost centimeter and a half of skin, skull, CSF, dura, um, uh, to reach the outer cortex of the brain. So with mirrors, um, so this is, this is an example of one of my near systems. This is a Tekken CW6. Uh, Tekken's a company out of Boston. It's one of maybe a dozen companies now that build commercial near systems. This one happens to have 32 detectors, 32 sources. And so we can build these fairly large head grids that measure from all over the head. Uh, the problem with mirrors is that putting these head caps on, especially in regions that you have hair, uh, is quite difficult. Uh, as we send the light through the tissue and detect it, we lose maybe four to six orders of magnitude between the light we put in and light we get out. And so if we have hair blocking it, if we're not making good contact with the scalp, uh, it's almost unusable uh, data at that point. And so there's a huge effort, 30 years of research, to try to build these caps to be able to measure in places that you have hair. And we still, after 30 years, don't have a great one-size-fits-all uh, solution. So with systems like this, although we can do 32 source detectors positioned all across the head, in most studies we don't do that. And in fact, if you came to me and said, I want to try mirrors out, I would say start with you know, maybe four sensors. Uh, because um, there's a huge learning curve uh, to the ability to collect data from some of these, these regions of hair. And so what that means with mirrors is you're typically talking about a few number of source detector pairs and a very focused hypothesis. 
in this case, I'm interested in left DLPFC. And so I know from the MRI, from the 1020 coordinates, approximately where to put my, my sources, and I go in with a very focused uh, hypothesis that this region of the brain will be active. Um, and so that's where I've, I've specifically put my source detector pairs. So unlike MRI uh, or, or even MEG for that matter, you can't really do these fishing expeditions of what part of the brain lights up when I do this, right? You have to kind of have some idea uh, where to start and that kind of comes from prior research. Uh, but the, the key advantages of mirrors is this is one of my largest systems, but it's still fairly portable. We move this, this a bit smaller than this, this podium here. We move it around the hospital systems. We bring the nearest instrument to you. Uh, you'll see in a second I have some even smaller systems that um, actually I have one in my hotel room right now that I'm trying to, to work to finish the acquisition software and it's about that big. Um, you know, these, these are systems that we can bring out to populations that you wouldn't uh, normally be able to scan with things like MRI. Um, it measures, as I said, oxygen, deoxyhemoglobin, and that's in comparison to something like the bold signal, which is, which is only deoxyhemoglobin. And so kind of inherently, we're always talking about multivariate um, statistics, because we have two measurements uh, uh, with, with mirrors. Uh, we have a high sample rate. The systems typically sample several tens of hertz, but they're fundamentally measuring that very slow, bold hemodynamic response. Um, and as I said, we're limited to the outer about five to eight millimeters of cortex with this. So in my lab, I'm a kind of an engineering lab. Um, I do method development, and I am lucky enough to work with a ton of different investigators who are end users to this technology. And so, so my lab is particularly focused on talking to those end users, understanding exactly what they want to achieve from their data. What is your hypothesis? and try to find the ways to uh, develop the analysis to help them reach that hypothesis, really kind of trying to understand what the limits uh, of mirrors actually are and what are valid uh, things to say about your data. Uh, so over the years, um, I think right now I have 25 active NIH grants that I'm a co-investigator on that are supporting uh, various things on this, this, this slide and a lot more. Uh, but kind of the things that we use mirrors for uh, supportability. So this is me in Ethiopia up the top of a mountain doing lower body negative pressure on people at high altitude. Uh, we're also doing CO2 challenges uh, with, 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 with that. Uh, I'll talk a lot about multimodal. So because we just use fiber optics, we can bring this into an MRI scanner, into a MEG, into an EEG, and I'll show a lot of that data. Um, it's low cost. Once you have a near system, it's fairly easy to scale up and do these large-scale studies. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm not so happy about that when investigators go and do N equals 200 uh, studies on an R21 and give me, you know, 2% effort to analyze 200 subjects worth of data. Uh, but, you know, at, you couldn't even imagine doing a N equals 200 study with, an, with MRI on that kind of, even on an R01 budget, that would be almost impossible. Uh, so, so you can start to get these very large-scale uh, studies. And we're starting to see a lot more of that in the field of these several hundred people uh, and studies. Um, we also are very interested in kind of logically valid studies. So that study that we've done for decades in the MRI, uh, you know, how does that relate to the actual real world? Um, so one of the applications, we have uh, an investigator who's doing, uh, has a K award under me, who's interested in dual task in gait. And there's been a lot of studies in the lab where you walk and you do, a, you do some sort of cognitive task and you show that gait speed slows down. But the kind of question is, well, how does this actually relate to, say, someone walking on the streets of Bethesda and there's a stoplight and you have to judge whether or not you have enough time to make it across the street and so on, these real world sort of analogs or these cognitive effects. And so with NEARS, one of the things that we've been interested in is kind of moving the technology into that kind of environment, this kind of real world type experiment. Um, but with that comes very unique challenges to how do you do analysis. I mean, I, I, I've had people come to me of like, hey, I collected some data on the streets of London walking around wearing a NEAR system. And I was like, okay, where are the events? And we don't know. What do you mean events? There's no event. You know, it's, how do you analyze something like that? 
Um, and, and as a field, we really don't know, but that's something that's really exciting to me to kind of even think about how you would even frame a hypothesis around data like that. And I have no clue, so please don't do that study without at least asking. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's the kind of thing that NEARs are starting to see in the NEARs field. Um, and then applications, we do a lot of balance and vestibular because you can wear these things while walking. I'll show a little bit of that. Multimodal, uh, pediatrics is a huge um, field for NEARs uh, because it's really easy to make NEARs measurements on a, a child or uh, I guess Joy will show some hyperscanning data uh, tomorrow with two people uh, doing these types of studies. Uh, and then there's unique populations, people that you can't put in an MRI scanner for whatever reason. Um, we've done work with bringing near systems into nursing homes. We've brought, uh, brought them into daycares. Carnegie Mellon actually has an instrument at daycare where we have one of our dedicated near systems actually inside of their daycare uh, to do scanning in, in kids. And so, so it's kind of these unique uh, populations uh, with, with NEARS. So, all right, what does NEARS data actually look like? Um, so as I said, you've got a grid of source detectors. In this case, my favorite subject, me, has uh, four sources down the middle. There's eight detectors to two rows of four. And what you're measuring is light going in at a source to a detector, so these, in, uh, these discrete pairwise source detector pairs. Uh, and each one, uh, each source is sending in at least two colors of light to give us that sensitivity to oxy versus deoxyhemoglobin. So if you did an experiment, you put this on, in this case it's the left motor cortex, you tap your fingers, you get the motor cortex response. Um, so what we would see is that the channels that were crisscrossing uh, that motor cortex would show the biggest change in oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. One of the challenges here is that anywhere that I didn't have a probe, I obviously don't have any information, so I can't say anything about. Even where I have the probe, like so for example, down the middle of the probe here, there's actually no source detectors that crisscross the middle of the probe. And so with a probe like this, you end up with uh, blind spots. Um, but if, if you did your experiment, you might see something like this, a nice change in oxy and deoxy hemoglobin in the channels that were closest to the motor cortex. Um, and if you looked at that, um, you would see this kind of typical hyperemic uh, hemodynamic response, the uh, so-called positive fold, uh, where if you tap your fingers and you get that change in neural activity, it drives metabolism. So you get CMRO2 pulling oxygen, driving oxyhemoglobin down, deoxyhemoglobin up. You get that compensating flow change that overcompensates by about two to three fold, driving the overall saturation up and increasing oxy, uh, decreasing deoxy. So it's the overall increase in uh, volume, increase in oxy, and this decrease in deoxyhemoglobin is what we see of the typical uh, hyperemic uh, NEARS uh, response. And there's a lot of information in here um, in terms of trying to relate that to these underlying states of flow and metabolism and things like timing differences between, you know, the onset of oxy and the onset of deoxy reflective of things like uh, vascular transit time and, and so on. Uh, my whole PhD for the most part was writing the balloon model, Winkessel uh, differential equations to describe this and trying to fit it to uh, nearest data, and that's about as much time as I'm going to spend on that. Um, that's not true. I'll return to it a little bit. Um, but one of the, the things that kind of early on, you know, in the nearest field when we came out and we were saying we were measuring the brain with light, you know, we had to, to validate it. I mean, still actually, occasionally we get reviewers on papers and grants and stuff that demand that we, we do this uh, validation as we move to new populations. And so the, the way, the gold standard, if you're measuring even and responses, is of course to do this in the MRI. And this is, this is easy to do, because we just use fiber optics. Uh, so this is work, this is actually uh, work that predates me. This is from David Boas's lab, um, where this was maybe back in 2004-ish, I think. You know, you had a single detector, a couple of sources, you stuck it over the motor cortex, you stuck the person in an MRI scanner and you had them tap their fingers and lo and behold, you got this, you know, this change in the bullet signal every time you tap your fingers, you got a change in the nearest signal 
uh, with roughly the same, the same uh, time constant. Uh, if you looked at a channel that was away from the motor cortex, you didn't see this. Um, and so there was this, you know, uh, are we measuring the same thing? And so when I started my, my PhD, which was 2002-ish, uh, um, this was kind of the state of the art. We put people in the MRI, we had them tap their fingers for say 20 seconds. Um, the problem with that is everything kind of goes up, everything kind of goes to steady state, comes back down. And so if you're trying to investigate uh, whether or not uh, the nearest signal, and specifically the deoxyhemoglobin component of the nearest signal, looks like the bold. That's what we knew from theory, is that bold should be sensitive to specifically deoxyhemoglobin as the, as the paramagnetic uh, species there. Um, that what would happen is if you did this experiment, because the oxyhemoglobin signal was generally bigger, uh, generally had better signal to noise, when you start to look at these correlations, what you end up finding is that oxy actually better predicts the bold signal because it's kind of a signal to noise uh, issue. And this was a problem at the time of these really long steady state experiments. So the first thing on here is a kind of a close up of that. Um, I guess this paper was actually in 2002, so even, even just when I started my PhD. And you see general agreement, but if you look at which one agrees better with the fMRI, it turns out it's actually oxyhemoglobin. Uh, and th at the time, there was maybe a dozen papers or so that had, had come to that sort of conclusion, which was against uh, what we thought should be true based on the physics. I'll note, too, even back in 2002, if you look at this, you start to see even things like the noise echoed between the two modalities. And you'll see that more as, as we progress into the, the current uh, data. So one of the first things I did for my PhD was to reprodu reproduce this experiment, but to do uh, a, a a shorter duration finger tapping, only tap for two seconds, where we would really emphasize the dynamics of that, the transients of that response. Uh, we were physicists um, as, and engineers, as a lot of people here are, and so tapping your fingers was our most exciting thing we knew about the brain. You do this, something happens over here. Um, so all of the PhD was basically finger tapping. Um, but we stuck people in the MRI scanner, long fiber optics that just go from the control room into the scanner uh, to do these simultaneous measurements. This is a 3T uh, the Siemens scanner. So, so we did, we ended up with, um, I think there were 20 subjects in this, this study. Uh, these are all normalized responses. So as I said, deoxy normally goes down. But what you see when you, when you do this, this experiment is uh, for the first time, we were able to show quite nicely that it specifically was this deoxyhemoglobin, that you had this delay time between essentially what our arterial weighted oxy in red and total hemoglobin in green and the venous weighted deoxy uh, with the nears and the bold signal. We, we ended up repeating that study. We used uh, uh, pulsed ASL, so now we're getting the flow component in addition to bold, and lo and behold, we saw that same timing difference echoed between the, again, the arterial and the venous weighted. So now, in this case, ASL uh, closely matches the blood volume uh, response. And there, there are subtle differences um, that we went on to try to model and explain in terms of um, um, uh, additional uh, complexities of, of the bold signal that came into there. But for the first time, this was, I think this was published in 2005-ish, uh, we were able to show quite conclusively that the, the, the nearest signal was uh, at least correlated to the thing we said it should be, the deoxyhemoglobin signal, or the, the bold signal. And actually, if you look at, this is just five subjects from that study, um, you can start to see features like uh, this, sub, this subject, for example, that time to peak between the arterial and the venous is very, very small. There's, all the data is almost on top of each other, um, but it's echoed in both modalities. This subject, you had a fairly long delay between, between the two. So things like the timing differences uh, between the arterial and the venous, whether it had an undershoot or a, a pre-stimulus dip, uh, we started to see as echoed between the subjects as a sign of real physiological variability, that we have these two completely different physics going on here, these two different modalities, and yet we're seeing the same sorts of underlying variability between subjects, the saying that it really was something interesting about that subject's brain um, or, or that session that was driving these kind of effects. So that was, that was temporal. Um, 
in order to kind of prove that NERIS was working, we also had to address the issue of spatial comparison. And, and this is rather challenging with NERIS because we have inherently this ill-posed inverse problem. We have typically maybe a dozen or so measurements trying to reconstruct a volume, you know, brain activity in the brain that maybe has thousands of unknown parameters to make it look like an image. And so this is, this is a ill-posed inverse problem. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit. But what we did at the time was, well, so when we do these experiments, we can localize our sensors because we can put vitamin E so we can actually know where uh, the, the fiber optics are. And if the contrast worked on my TIF images, you could actually see that. Um, um, but the, the, so this is the nearest forward model. It basically says that the changes in volume space project through this lead field. These A matrices here are basically the sensitivity of any of the matrices, the matrix of uh, source detector pairs. So we often refer to these as the banana functions because kind of they dip down and kind of look like a banana diffusing through the tissue. Uh, but these describe how channels, individual source detector pairs, uh, are sensitive to the underlying volume. And as I said, going from this couple dozens of measurements into this volume space of several thousands of unknowns is underdetermined and, and ill posed. There's no unique solution to it. So it's not fair to try to reconstruct data in brain space to compare to MRI, right? It would be so sensitive to how you did this inverse problem. So what we ended up doing was actually the opposite. We know this because we did MRI, right? So I know what the volume wise changes are, and so I can project them out and predict what the channel based NEARS should have looked like. And what that allows us to do is test the hypothesis, was NEARS consistent with that underlying MRI signal? And so that's what we ended up doing. This is a image of, so in blue here is the measured NEARS signal, in black is the uh, NEARS signal predicted based on the MRI, so projecting it through that Ford operator. And you see nicely that the channels that showed the biggest deflections as predicted by the MRI were exactly the channels that we measured uh, with the NEARS. It allows you to start to be quantitative in that comparison to actually look at what the spatial correlation between um, the predicted MRI and the measured uh, NEARS actually was. Uh, and so what we ended up finding again, just like in the temporal case, was that the fMRI predicted the NEARS. So, so it, was, it was a nice um, validity, across validity to uh, what we were doing at the time, uh, which was trying to prove to people that NEARS actually worked. Um, you know, a couple of years later, um, uh, we've dissected that signal a lot further and start to look at things like uh, common sources of noise. And so if you look, this is just a, um, what is this, eight, seven, eight uh, trials of a, of a finger tapping task. And what you see is, you know, each green line is they tap their fingers. We have sensors so we actually know they, they tap. And you see you get these, you know, that's a good trial. You see nice responses, nice responses, not so nice responses for whatever reason, and then good trials again. This is just an example. It's a little bit cherry-picked. Um, but what you see is that that variability is echoed between the two modalities, right? So whatever happened in these two trials, whether the subject wasn't paying attention or, or whatever it was, whatever the underlying cause was. We, we know they're actually tapping their fingers, um, but you get that variability echoed between the two modalities. So it's saying it's something inside the brain that's driving this. And so if you take all your data and you be a little bit more robust with that statistics, what you end up finding is about 70% of the variance is shared between the two modalities. Of that, about half of that shared variance can be attributed to things like respiratory. Blood pressure is the big one, it's the title CO2, as was pointed out, um, uh, that you, 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 can, you can explain half of that variance. But the other half of that variance is shared between the two modalities, uh, but related to things like single trial variability. For whatever reason, I can't attribute it to, phys to systemic physiology, but these two trials had lower amplitude than the other trials, um, and it was seen in both modalities. And so we're trying to kind of um, use that to understand what are uh, these, these features in our data that we're often just lumping into this 
statistical term that we call standard error, right? This is noise, but it's not instrument noise. And so potentially actually could be interesting about what's going on in the brain. Um, you, you can, as, as was, uh, I think, mentioned uh, yesterday, you can start to use this to, to denoise your data. So this is an example. This is David Boas' lab from Harvard. Um, but in, in this experiment, what we have is a single uh, near sensor, one source, one detector placed on the side of the head right there. And what we're looking at here is a, a variance map. So 100% so would be the original data. And if I do a pulse oximeter and I do kind of the retro I-core type stuff, I see I knock down the variance in the vent, you know, in, around the, um, the, the brain stem sort of arterial sort of feeding there. I, if I add uh, respiratory, um, you, you see I knock down a lot of that frontal artifact that was coming from the MR. Uh, but if you take that single uh, near sensor and you take the deoxy hemoglobin component and you, you again do that retro I-core uh, sort of trick, you can knock down quite a bit more variance. If you add oxyhemoglobin in there, so now you have all four as nuisance regressors, you can, you can uh, drop the variance down even, even more than that. And so this was an example from David's lab of using uh, mirrors and uh, this kind of really simple addition of a single mirror sensor placed on the side of the, of the head to really get a local measure of systemic, uh, of, of, of cerebral systemic physiology and using that to kind of clean up your, your MRI data like that. I don't think David ever actually published on this. I've used this slide as unpublished for about eight years now and I don't think he ever actually published it. Um, but um, that's, that's all the work that we did for my PhD and now, this is actually now 13 years later and 400,000 lines of MATLAB code. Um, our pipeline is a lot more sophisticated in terms of the ways that we can start to use uh, this sort of multimodal fMRI mirrors uh, data. And so, so this, um, uh, much like the pipelines in MEG or EEG, we start with anatomical MRI. We can segment it to create boundary element models that drive our mirrors forward models. So where does the light go in the head? Um, we can take those forward models and our nearest data to make inverse models. So we can actually do image reconstructions to bring the nearest data into a brain space, much like you see with MEG EEG. In fact, actually our pipeline, a lot of the tools that we use, so we use FreeSurfer to segment the head, it's the exact same boundary element models that we use for our MEG EEG as we use for the nearest. So when we reconstruct in this space, we actually have our brains from all these different modalities in the exact same, uh, uh, exact same cortical uh, space. And, and so, you know, years later, um, I repeated that same experiment, uh, that, that simultaneous measure. I graduated from finger tapping to median nerve electrical stimulation. Uh, uh, this time we actually recorded, we added MEG to that study. So long fiber optics going in under the MEG um, uh, sensors. Um, you have to be very careful in the materials you use. MEG is actually a way more sensitive than MRI to um, making sure that you have compliant materials in there. Uh, you can never use your fiber optics from this study into that study. You just can't degauss them well enough. So you have, have to use completely separate $20,000 sets of fiber optics. Um, but we took all our subjects, we, we brought them into the MEG, did simultaneous mirrors MEG, did simultaneous MRI uh, mirrors, and actually for the last, I think it was five or so subjects, we actually added EEG. So we did EEG, mirrors, and MRI at the same time. Um, and for all the studies, uh, the subjects, we did a media nerve task. Um, uh, this was just a block, a uh, 10 second on off. We also did a pulse pair that I'm not going to uh, talk about. But we went and we took our data and we passed it through this complicated pipeline, which kind of represented the best we knew how to analyze our nearest data at the time. And um, this is the results that we got. Uh, so here we're looking at the fMRI, the MEG, and then the two nearest, and down here is the EEG. And we see we can actually start to localize our nearest data to even the same, the right gyrus as the other uh, modalities. Uh, and so by, by kind of pulling out all the stops and using all the information available to us, 
we're actually able to get really nice agreement now with, with NEARS. So this is kind of the current state of the art. Um, and I'm being told I'm running out of time, and I still probably have about 20 slides left, so I will speed up here. Uh, so this is just a close-up showing that. Now, there's a little trick that, that is, is, is in these images in that this is not actually just NEARS. Uh, this is NEARS that's been informed by the structural information of the MRI. So we're actually using uh, not only the knowledge of the MRI to guide that forward model, but we actually have multimodal ways to actually in integrate that into the inverse model itself. So I'm going to skip that slide in, in, in the case of time. Uh, so one of the ways that we, we do this is um, thinking about the, the brain and what's going on. We know that, you know, from animal studies, from, from anatomy, we know that, you know, most of actually the, the the neural, most of the activity is actually occurring on the surface of the brain. It's in the gray matter, the cortex. Um, and, and so instead of, one of the innovations we did was instead of trying to reconstruct images of brain volumes, we decided to reconstruct images of textures on the surface. So basically modeling the cortical surface and what's going on at the cortical surface, much like you do in a dipole model for or these models that we're using for MEG and EEG a lot of times. But in, what that does is that instead of going from a 2D source detector into a 3D volume, you're going from 2D into another 2D surface. And so, so, so we, we, we constrain it that way. And one of the innovations that uh, my postdoc, uh, who is a, a mathematician uh, he, who specialized in wavelengths, came up with is this way to basically model the surface of the brain using wavelengths. And so, so uh, for those of you that use free surfer, you know you have this relationship of this uh, recursively subdivided icosahedral that expands to get these finer and finer resolution uh, 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 matrices of, of the brain uh, like this. So at, at J equals four, I think you have 5,000 unknowns. At here, you have maybe 10,000 unknowns per hemisphere, something of that nature. Um, and what, uh, what my, my postdoc did was he built on that model uh, in order to describe, uh, to use wavelets. And so, so you, you're probably all familiar with wavelets in terms of an image, right? You take a wavelet of an image and it's a way of compressing it uh, because wavelets more efficiently describe that, that image. And so you get uh, a couple of coefficients that are really important and the rest are close to zero, you can, you can throw them out. And what it's doing is it's modeling it both as a function of uh, spatial location and spatial uh, frequency, essentially. Well, what uh, spherical wavelets are, are that same idea of a wavelet, but instead of describing a two-dimensional object, it's describing a texture on a manifold. And so what we do is we model the brain, we reparameterize our model using this, where if we took our original image, point spread function like that, and if we modeled it using five layers of wavelets, we get back the original with you know, a fourth the number of degrees of freedom, we get a same location but a blurry, and as we lower our degrees of freedom, uh, we get a smoother and smoother image uh, with, um, but kind of having the same position. And the, the idea of this is because it's described on this manifold, what happens is those wavelets, that smoothing is actually going down the foci. So instead of smoothing voxels, and kind of blurring, say, the motor cortex of the somatosensory, it's actually smoothing along the texture, so it's integrating that, those gyral folds. Um, I'm going to skip this as well, because that's math. And so, so when we do this, we're able to actually get these images that when we look at this, we see, you know, we have this smooth image, but it's smooth obeying the curvature of the brain. And so this is an example of multimodal integration that we're using this structural uh, M, uh, MRI for this. And I totally misjudged how long it was going to take me to talk about this. You guys got me excited about this. Um, how much time do I have? Like five minutes? Zero minutes? Ten minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So one of the other things, so that's kind of multimodal, kind of where I have structural MRI, I'm using it to guide, to help my, my nearest problem. Um, but we've also worked on this idea of actual true fusion, this idea of, you know, putting it together and getting something that neither modality could get by itself. 
And so, so NIRS MRI is kind of a natural way to think about this because we do share this commonality of deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, we have this complement in terms of MRI, good spatial, but low temporal resolution, NIRS just the opposite, um, both of which are uncalibrated, as you heard yesterday in talks of people do CO2 challenges or QBOLD or something to try to calibrate it. Uh, but inherently, BOLD is a percent signal change. NIRS is a unknown signal change because we don't know that path length. Uh, we don't know that partial volume. Uh, we just know it occurred somewhere along this diffuse path. And so we have trouble uh, getting calibrated units on our NIRS data. And so what we did in that context was we, we took a look at the NIRS Ford model. As I said, this projection from volume space out to measurement space that we, um, despite my last couple of slides, you know, saying that this was, you know, an ill-posed inverse problem. By itself, we don't have really enough information to get a good image here. If we look at the MRI problem, and specifically the extravascular model, which kind of dominates at higher field strengths, uh, what we see is a very similar equation. So we have deoxyhemoglobin projected through some, um, uh, some, some uh, calibration term to give the bold data. We don't have any information from MRI about oxyhemoglobin, uh, but we still have the same sort of matrix equation. Alpha here is that uh, this, this parameter that depends on things like field strength and volume fraction and, and baseline oxygen saturation. Uh, but in general, we don't know those things. Um, and so what you can do is instead of solving this as two completely separate models and fusing it in the discussion of your paper, what you can do is you can stack those two lead fields into a single operator that, and stack your data so you have nearest component and an MRI component that is projecting the same underlying changes in, in the brain. And so now instead of inverting two models, you invert one much larger model. Uh, you have to introduce concepts that the MRI had different noise structures than the nearest. So you have to do some sort of Bayesian uh, sort, of, um, sort of model. We use REML. Uh, to kind of estimate those, those hyperparameters differently for the different um, uh, hierarchical levels, the NIRS and the MRI, and then oxy versus deoxy. Um, but you can go and you can solve this inverse model now where you're estimating a common set of unknowns from your multimodal data. And what you, you can do too is you can also think of this, start to think of this as a missing data problem. The MRI has an image that's coming in every two minutes, two seconds, sorry. The nearest has data coming in every uh, you know, 20 hertz. And so you, you basically can start constraining spatially the data every two seconds, but filling in the temporal gaps with the nearest. And so at the end of the day, you end up with movies that have nearly the temporal resolution of the nearest, nearly the spatial resolution of the MRI. Um, so this is MRI by itself. This is the fusion reconstruction. Uh, the first thing that kind of stares out is this one's blue and that one's red, because this is a percent signal change, whereas this one is actually a calibrated micromolar unit of hemoglobin. Um, I kind of left it out, but in iterating through this, we use the NIRS data to solve for that alpha term, that calibration of the MRI. I use the MRI knowing where it spatially is to calibrate the NIRS, and I do this back and forth as I solve this, uh, this joint inverse model. And so at the end of the day, we get these calibrated images of uh, of hemoglobin changes in absolute units. And we've gone on, we've published this uh, first as an image reconstruction, and then we did, David Lois's group later did hypercapnic challenges showing this agreed with uh, what you would get from the Davis model. Um, uh, this, was, this, this was not David's uh, paper there that, that did this, but this is just showing. Um, you can do this with other modalities, so it doesn't have to necessarily be this physics model that I believe NIRS and MRI both measure the same thing. You can do it with as a statistical prior. So this is just an example. This is EEG and NIRS fusion, where we've taken that same idea, fused them into a single matrix. Um, now we don't have any cross terms in the actual lead field itself, but we do have cross terms in the priors that we're going to use on the statistical level. I believe that EEG probably comes from the same location as the NIRS. I use something like REML to estimate those hyperparameters, estimate the strength of that joint, uh, that, that, that off-diagonal, that covariance matrix. And at the end of the day, reconstructing images of EEG 
EEG with NIRS priors and NIRS with EEG priors at the same time. Uh, so this is EEG alone. This is EEG with NIRS as, as a prior. Um, so even though both NIRS and EEG themselves were uh, ill-posed inverse problems, uh, I'll say this is 32-channel EEG, uh, we're able to actually, uh, it's, it's the point spread function EEG drops by about half in the areas that we have the NIRS to be informative. In areas that we don't have the nearest probe, it's just like having EEG alone. Um, so say if the nearest probe was on the forehead, my EEG reconstruction on the back of the head is the same as just having EEG, but at the forehead where I had that nearest prior, I can actually uh, localize uh, quite a bit. Um, the nearest improvement is not quite as, as dramatic. In fact, actually, if anything, it became a little blurrier by adding that EEG information. Um, and so, what you can do, that's all linear models. You can start to think about nonlinear extensions, integrating things like metabolism and flow, uh, which allows you to start to put things like ASL into this model. So you can start to think about bold and ASL and mirrors all put together uh, and trying to estimate nonlinear models to get out things like flow and metabolism. Um, so this was early work. This was work we did with Rick Hogue, where we took mirrors to get oxygen saturation. We took uh, ASL to get flow. This one had a low temporal resolution. This one had a low spatial resolution. So the end of the day, in Rick's paper, we got estimates of metabolism with low spatial, low temporal resolution, just a single ROI. But if we take those concepts now with fusion, we can start to actually integrate them to get uh, images, movies, uh, with the temporal spatial features of both modalities. Uh, put together. So this is now images of flow and OEF uh, derived from a concurrent NIRS MRI ASL uh, bold uh, experiment. Um, and we do the same thing with, with, with EEG. I'm going to skip that uh, in the interest of time. I have like 10 seconds, so I'll, I'll talk about my co-box really quick. Um, all of this stuff is actually, we're very, we try to be as open as possible. We put it all on, we have a bit bucket. Um, uh, repository, we have a Bitbucket toolbox called the nearest toolbox because I'm, I'm not very creative with these things. Um, but we, we basically try to put all of these tools on there. Uh, we right now, we, we're nowhere near field trip or, or even m and &E Python. We have about 5,000 people that have downloaded and used our tools. I only have two contributors, uh, one of which is standing at this podium. Um, in, in fact, actually 50% of my lab is standing at this podium right now. Uh, so we don't have a lot of infrastructure to, to help support that. Um, but um, one of the things that we've done is we've tried to integrate, you know, kind of best practices of years in terms of some of the statistical models. And we've recently extended this to handle both EEG and kind of the dense time series surface-based uh, SIFTI um, uh, data. Uh, we're not reproducing, we're not reinventing the wheel, so we recycle all these tools from uh, particularly field trip for, for a lot of the pre-processing for the EEG, but once we get it all into the same statistical space, now we can we, we have these uh, data sets that we can start to play with to do these things like multimodal reconstruction. And so that's really we've, where we've been focused is using these, developing these joint inverse models, these joint statistical models, just try to get all of our data into this same space where we're estimating what was the brain that gave rise to all of this data simultaneously. Um, and I'll stop there just with funding um, that I've, as I said, I've had a lot of uh, support from the NIH through collaborators that have supported and driven a lot of these, these methods. Um, so thank you. We have time for one question. Everyone's just hungry. Maybe a very naive question. Uh, why, why is NIRS always limited to a, um, a small part of the cortex? Is there like a whole cap? Of we can do a whole. We can do a whole head probe, right? Um, but that's, but it's it's like uh, think of it like doing high density EEG, right? If you're going to make measurements over the entire head, you're probably going to spend, if you're good, maybe 30 minutes putting that uh, probe on the head, um, and which people do. Um, but the problem is most near studies are interested in special populations, infants, you know, that aren't going to sit for 30 minutes. 
And so it's just not worth it to do those, those kind of studies. Um, so it's more of a practical uh, thing. All right, let's thank Dr. Hubbard again. We're now going to take a lunch break uh, for the next 90 minutes, so come back at 1 p.m. Um, again, speakers, if you would like assistance finding one of the many food courts, let us know. Um, see you all in about 90 minutes.